Um, thank you for that very kind introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today and hopefully I can demystify a few things that Air Force have been working on over the last couple of years. All right, I grew up in a little country town in Victoria. I have a sister and I went to an all-girls school. At no point in my upbringing did I ever think I couldn't do anything I wanted to do. And then I joined the Air Force. <laughs> Um, I'd wanted to be a pilot since I was about seven years old and I learned to fly when I was 14, 15, went solo when I was 15. I used to have to get my grandfather to drive me to the aerodrome so I could then fly the plane by myself and then get him to drive me home. <laughs> um, and I knew from a very early age that that's what I wanted to do. Yeah, um, it was a careers advisor at my school, an all-girls school, who suggested I consider the military. I played pretty high-level sport at school and in Victoria, and, um, and I'd always done pretty well academically. Um, and I'd already liked flying, and I already knew what I wanted to do. And um, I went into Defence Force recruiting in 1994, and they said, girls can't be pilots, sweetheart. And I went home and off my wall, I took the newspaper card out that I had had in there, on there since 1986 that showed Robin Williams and Deb Hicks graduating as the first women pilots of the Air Force. And I literally took that into Defence Force recruiting and said, really? <laughs> um, I learned a few things about myself along the way. One, I'm a red-headed girl from the country. Saying no to me is really just the start of the negotiation. <laughs> Um, and I found that has pretty much been the story of my career up until, uh, up until now. I spent the first five to ten years of my career in the Air Force trying to fit in. I didn't know who I was. I was a young woman who was now thrust into this male-dominated environment. I looked younger than I am. I spoke more politely. Um, and I, I really struggled with those complex negotiations, I guess, of my femininity. And I look at what I did in those first five to 10 years of my career, and I had some incredible experiences, but it didn't really propel me to an excellent career. That happened when I stopped trying to be someone else, when I stopped trying to fit in, when I stopped trying to drink like the boys, fight like the boys, <laughs> smoke cigars like the boys, um, swear like the boys, don't tell my mother. Um, it wasn't until I had had a few pivotal opportunities to see other women doing what I wanted to do, that I started realising, oh, if they can do it, I can do it. And that was when I did C-17 conversion training in America with the United States Air Force. And I was just one of 10 Air Force students and one of about 40 women. And for the first time in my career, I didn't stick out. Because when you stick out as a minority, it doesn't matter if you have a good day or a bad day, your normal day is everyone's business and you don't get the luxury of a bad day and a good day. And when I've worked with Americans, I did. And with that, I had this journey into diversity and I call it that because if you had told me that quotas would be important, I would have told you to bloody F off because that's rubbish. Girls should be here if they're good enough and they're promoted on merit. And I truly do not believe that because I don't think we're quite at a system where the minorities get the same voice and the level playing field the, the majorities. But I do acknowledge that Air Force is certainly incredibly progressive in this area. And with that in mind, I ended up working on a project um, when the uh, Air Force instigated workforce diversity. We had a two-year remit and it was the first time it was, um, it was built up. It was uh, a new concept. And my remit was to look at the pilot retention problem because for the last seven to eight years, Air Force had not met its pilot recruitment targets. So this wasn't a problem for women and it wasn't a problem for men. This was a problem for the demographic of Australia, of which 25% of Australia's youth population are not born in Australia. So that intrinsic motivation that we heard about earlier to join and be part of the Anzac spirit doesn't exist with 25% of our youth population. Another demographic that we discovered were women. Women, is, women are 50% of the Australian population, yet we were severely underrepresented by women, in, certainly in piloting roles, but also in the military overall and the Air Force. And the other demographic that was severely underrepresented were career change men. So these were people who might have wanted to join the military as youth, had gone off and done university or trades and done other jobs, and now in their mid to late 20s and early 30s, they were utterly uncaptured by Defence Force recruiting because they weren't the 17 year to 18 year old that we usually target. Right, so this was a wide ranging program of work and 
initiatives were in all of those, but I will speak specifically to the gender and the women. And one thing I just want to clarify is the difference between equality, equity and being equitable. And I'll give you an example. Uh, as a flight commander at 36 Squadron, managed about 40, 50 people, majority of whom were young men in their 20s and older men, I say older men, sorry, gents, in their 50s. And yet we work in an open plan office. So it's equal. They're all allowed to come to work. They're all qualified. Being equitable means that there is a barrier and not everyone can see over it. Open plan is not a very conducive environment to some people being able to study and perform. People would bring in their noise cancelling headphones. Someone suggested the sombrero of silence. <laughs> if you're wearing that, don't talk to me. Um, and there were all these kind of things that we tried to do to get around the issue of this open plan office. And I think the challenge for the leadership moving forward in our organisations, in order to be equitable, figure out what the barrier is, get rid of it. All right, if it doesn't need to be there, get rid of it. And if that means for two days before you do a big exam that you need to study where you like to study, that's what you do. And with that in mind, we embarked on some data and research. So at the time in 2010, 17% of the Air Force were women and women pilots constituted 2.6% of the Air Force. The barriers to that representation, there were lots of them. However, the main ones were, we found that there were some social hurdles for Australian women. One is the military. For a woman, a young woman in Australia in 2010 to join the military, she kind of had to overcome a social hurdle. Yet for an Australian woman to join aviation, and I mean civil aviation, she also had to overcome a social hurdle. So here we were trying to fix the problem of military aviation. Actually, we had to get women who needed to overcome two social hurdles. And the easiest way to do that was to target each of these demographics that have already overcome something. Um, there was a program of work for military women to re-roll and do some testing to become pilots. And equally, we looked at women who were already studying civil aviation. And this, this program of work happened at Griffith University in Queensland, where they had 30% of women studying in their aviation program. And when we did focus groups with these women, and in fact the whole course, nearly 98% of the young men who were studying civil aviation had tried to join the military and for whatever reason we were unsuccessful or chose not to. And do you know how many women had even considered it? Yeah, nearly zero, one percent. <laughs> um, in fact, it was just one lady. So, and I was like, well, but why? What were the barriers to them even considering joining the Air Force? And the result was, didn't want the 10-year obligation, the ROSO, because they're at university now, or they're looking to be in the oh, 30s, it's a really, un, you know, I don't really want to be still serving in that time um, and the Air Force women's uniform is ugly. <laughs> Two key barriers. So how do I remove the barriers? Right, let's work and we've got some new Air Force women uniform um, models working around. Great, great, loving it. Um, the second one is, well if Rosso is a real barrier, is there a way that we can either get rid of it or repackage it? Get rid of me. Um, motherhood was a huge thing. Up until this point, almost e every woman who'd had a baby, a pilot who'd had a baby, had left. Some had come back to work and others, had re um, and others hadn't. It was just too hard. And it depended on your boss at the time. Most people had great bosses initially, and then the new boss had to inherit the problem, quote unquote. Um, so we worked a little bit about that, actually writing policy, developing initiatives that could be implemented. Um, the initial policy that I was employed under to come back to flying after having my children uh, was it wasn't a total disaster, um, but it just wasn't realistic. Great boss, new policies, we made it work. And now every single Air Force woman pilot who has had a child is going back to flying or has gone back to flying. Um, and that had never happened before. If a demographic of minority is under 10% represented, they are a pioneering demographic. Okay? And there are some complexities of being in a pioneering demographic. And I think there are some responsibilities associated with that. You can't just keep pioneering and survive. The days of not helping people behind you, and I look at the pioneering women who came before me, and I'm in awe of them, and they're incredible survivors, um, and they chipped away at a road. If I don't pave that road, and if I don't allow the women coming behind me to literally tar the hell out of that road, then I'm now failing in my duty for the next generation, because it has to get better. Ironically, under the Sexual Discrimination Act, you can um, employ special measures for a minor minority demographic until they reach 50%. However, society or organisations will feel like that minority is at um, a 50-50 if they reach 25%. 
Um, also, holistic career management, not just for um, members, but for partners and families. There was a quote recently by an MP that said, you know, the, the old paradigm of the single income family with the stay at home mum is not how modern families like to operate. You know, it's not how we can afford mortgages. It's not how society is built. More women than men go to university. Professionals in our society and in the military family construct are now the new norm. How is our career management adapting to that and is it? Uh, so Project Winter was born. We focused on the uh, demographic. We did some work for the, for the career change men uh, and then we looked at, right, let's this 50% demographic of women, the 30% who are studying aviation at civil university, let's see what it would take to encourage them to join the Air Force. Project Winter, women in non-traditional employment roles was born. We totally stole it from the Canadians. And we looked at four areas which was different to other organisations. So we looked at the recruitment, but more importantly, None of us in the team could consciously look at recruitment without fixing retention and developing progression. And in all of those areas, support had to be number one. And if you are more interested in this, I'm happy to talk ad nauseum about it. And the Air Force Workforce and Diversity website has all of the information about all of those initiatives. And what has happened in the last nine years? A combination of all these programs and the Air Force now is on target to meet 25% women by 2023. And Air Force has 5.6%, 5.6, women pilots. The global average for the aviation industry of female representation as pilots is 5%. It is really impressive that a military can actually achieve that global civil average. But there are some downsides and realities, I think, to this. And that is, these strategic policies have been incredibly effective, but what is happen happening at the coalface is still a fight and a need to justify, and I still get it daily, or not daily, but quite often, wh why? Why do you need to be, why can't we just have more men doing this? Um, when are you gonna stop reducing the standard for women? The standard has not been dropped for women. We have got new platforms coming on, the standard has been changed for everyone. The ejection seat parameters on the PC-21 are different to the ejection seat parameters for the PC-9. PC Standards are different. Um, and, this, you know, and this came from a, from a recent trainee, guy, a woman, who said, well, I don't understand why you're dropping it. We have women and men in our organisations who don't actually believe they belong here and that they've been made to feel like they're here because there's some quota or requirement for them the standard is still required to pass. Um, a quote from a, a, young, a young woman who came through recruiting recently by the recruiter, Defence Force recruiter. Well, I basically have to appoint you. You're a, you're a chicken, you're Asian, tick, tick. Right? This culturally is now having to be faced at the coalface. Um, this one I, I got on one of my check rides. I don't understand why I'd employ a woman when I could just employ a man. I actually failed that check ride. And to this day, I don't know if I failed is because I deserve to fail or because I was always going to fail. And that is what annoys me more because I didn't think I was quite ready for the check, but now I will never know. So these bring up some challenges and I think there's a whole lot of PhD work available to someone for this in the future. But, um, but there are solutions, right? There is a lot of great talk, but can we please start walking the walk? There are these gatekeepers, um, senior NCO level, junior officer, middle management level, if they are not brought on this journey, these policies and initiatives happened in 2010. The people who are now in these supervisory and senior middle management roles, do they know why these policies happened? Do they understand it? Or have they just decided they didn't like it at the start and now they can do something about it? Um, and that is certainly the, um, the experience that I'm, I'm hearing about young women in aviation units. Oh, my supervisor doesn't think I should do that because he doesn't agree with these policies. All right, we've got a bit of work to do there. And um, the question earlier about psychological safety, uh, I said, thanks, Leslie. Yeah, look, I completely agree with that. If you are having a visceral reaction to a certain person's car in the car park or when you walk up the stairs to work, then our organisations are failing those members. Um, uh, yeah, and dinosaurs, please get left behind. <laughs> so from Caitlin and I, 
Uh, I hope this sort of photo in the future will not be unusual and it will be completely normal. And I encourage everybody to wear a Wonder Woman bandana when flying the aeroplanes. Um, thank you for your time.